Hello and welcome to episode two of the new the new podcast about sort of new economic modelling and the new way of doing business in the 21st century. Hopefully, we're going to use the phrase post-COVID because we're kind of presuming that will actually happen. Um, so if you, if you have just tuned in after listening to episode one, you're now listening to episode two, you'll know that in the last episode, my guests were Rory Sutherland from Ogilvy, uh, Dave Wetzel, the former chairman of Transport for London, and uh, Eric Masaba, the founder of uh, the founder of, the, of ride sharing as a as a concept and the founder of, of Taxi, uh, we have the same guests. Nice bit of bit of flow, a nice bit of uh, uniformity. We have the same guests. So welcome, welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for your time once again. They're all it's nodding. a pleasure. If only you Wonderful. Could, if any sort of video video podcast, you can see all my guests nodding on mute. Anyway, so thank you again for, for joining us. So in the last episode, we talked about localism. We talked about Georgism. And we talked about all kind of manner of interesting and innovative ways of, of basically sort of sharing sharing road space, sharing mobility, sharing airport space, whatever. So we're going to be continuing that theme because it was an interesting, for me, an interesting discussion. Mm -hmm. So um, in episode one, we mentioned the idea of auctioning road space. So Eric's theory of road space time, and that's what you, you buy slots or slices of road space time. We briefly mentioned William Vickery. Um, and Dave, you would like to talk more about William Vickery because you didn't, <coughs> didn't have an awful lot of time to discuss him. Could we, do you want to continue talking about William Vickery? Because that, that was a fascinating discussion and his ultimate demise is also rather ironic too. Yeah, William Vickery is uh, one of my uh, heroes amongst economists. And um, quite rightly, uh, as Eric said, he was, uh, a researcher on the whole question of road pricing and an advocate of road pricing. But in addition, he did a lot of theory work on auctions. And when Gordon Brown in year 2000 decided to auction the access to the 3G mobile phone network, the airwaves, um, he, he could have just sold the freehold. He could have had an auction uh, and just sold the airwaves uh, for a one big figure. He decided not to do that. He could have given it away. Thatcher even gave away some of our airwaves. Um, he could have given them away, but he decided to auction them on a 20 year lease. And that was the right policy because the airwaves are a part of the commons provided by nature. Mm -hmm. And so, his civil servant said, oh, you'll get about five, six billion pounds. Well, he auctioned them using William Vickery's methods and ended up with 22.4 billion pounds. Now, immediately afterwards, uh, people, there was the crash of the dot-com and all that stuff. And people were saying, oh, they paid too much. But uh, they never went bankrupt and uh, they got a good <coughs> deal. And now uh, we can auction them again, thanks to Gordon Brown foresight. And um, the other thing that William Vickery promoted um, and studied was the idea of collecting the rent of land to pay for public purposes, uh, what I call land value tax, but has several different names. <coughs> and uh, William Vickery was actually awarded the Nobel Prize and as a result, he was going to a meeting of Georges, people who advocate land value tax, to celebrate with them in the United States. And unfortunately, he died on the way to his celebration of hearing he got the Nobel Prize. But that's William Vickery, one of my uh, heroes. So can we, it's a, a, a sad way to go, but it, to, to win a sort of prestigious honour and not collect it. I won, in 2000, I won the business, um, the business periodicals ad editor of the year. Uh, and I was away on holiday and couldn't pick up my prize. It's not the same thing, but I know it's a, it's a similar, you know. There's a, there's a, well, at least you didn't there. die. <laughs> no, I didn't die. No, I was on holiday. It was absolutely fine. But um, I know it, missing out on a prize is, is, a, is a sad thing. Um, sorry, I'm not trivialising the death of, uh, of, of William Bickery at all. Um, so can we apply that, the idea of auctioning space? Can we therefore, along Eric's principles, which he's been 
fine tuning and honing for years. Can we apply the auctioning principles to road space? Can we auction road space in the same way? In the United States, um, I, I, I was visiting um, in East Sota and um, in Minneapolis, St. Paul, uh, they had a bus lane, and uh, which is not unusual. It was on a freeway, very fast road. Um, but um, it wasn't very successful because there weren't many buses. You wouldn't expect in the United States to see yeah. too many buses. <clears throat> so what they decided to do was to let cars enter the busway, and uh, they changed the price that you entered at according to the congestion on the road. If it was totally free running, then it would be about 10 cents. As the traffic built up, it would go to 20, 30, 50 cents. And if it really got dense, they'd go to 80 cents. And then people joining the busway could make a decision. Am I late for an appointment? Am I late for a job interview? Well, then I will pay to get there quicker. But if like me, I spend time taking my grandchildren to the park. If you're doing a non-essential journey, then you think, well, sorry, I'm not going to pay all that. I'll, I'll stay in the congested lanes. And I think that's a good example. And another similar example is parking. There's uh, one town in America that charges according to the availability of car parking spaces. So if there's lots of car parking spaces available, the price is cheap, but as they fill up, then the price goes up and they price it always to keep two empty spaces. So in the town, you know you can definitely park if you come, but you might have to pay a lot of money to park your car. That, that funnily enough, is very close to an idea I've had for a while, which is um, I'm very, very interested in the psychology of price. And one alternative I'd offer to their bus lane road pricing model would be arguably a more egalitarian model, uh, which is that the day before you can reserve your right to use the bus lane as a form of insurance. So you might pay a set amount, a lower amount, and that would mean that in the event of, um, and so poorer people, there's always a danger that, you know, the question is, are you allocating the space to the impatient and the people who genuinely need to make an appointment? Or are you merely allocating it to the rich and impatient? And I always thought that psychologically it would be slightly different if you, book, if you had the option of booking at a lower price insurance for your journey the day before. So there'd be a ceiling to how much you might end up having to pay. Now, obviously, sometimes Minneapolis would collect a load of money because people paid to ensure their journey and the congestion never materialised. But at other times when there was congestion, it wouldn't just be Bentleys shifting into the left-hand lane, as it were. It would be people who had a doctor's appointment who are willing to pay, say, two bucks yeah. as a flat fee in advance. And I'm very interested. I mean, there's a wonderful um, paper by John Locke called Venditio about the just price. And one moral issue about pricing, which makes, I think, things like road pricing complicated, is John Locke's conclusion, and I'm paraphrasing incredibly because it was written in 1690 and had examples about selling a horse and ships buying anchors, is we tend to regard it as slightly immoral or unpleasant for anyone to capitalize on someone else's misfortune. So to profit from someone else's desperation, and that explains why Walmart, for example, when there's a massive snowstorm, they don't put the prices up for show snow shovels. Because if they do that, economists regard it as perfectly rational that you should just treble the price of snow shovels when there's some massive kind of whiteout. But what Walmart knows perfectly well is people resent that and they don't come back to Walmart to buy other things. And so what Walmart does is it actually has an incredible climate centre that looks out for tornadoes, hurricanes, snowfall. And if they know there's going to be a heavy snowstorm, they just ship enormous quantities of snow shovels to those Walmart locations. And so if you can find a way of pricing um, for road congestion, which doesn't look, A, as if you've got an incentive to create the problem from which you profit. Yep. And B, um, that essentially is felt to be fair because you're not 
profiting from someone's desperation. And that's why I think the insurance model as an option uh, to pay as you go might be important. I mean, one of the reasons, if you think about any kind of new tax, like land value tax, one of the reasons it's never really got full public popularity is every time the government adds a new tax, it doesn't remove or reduce a pre-existing tax. And so we've never had, every, everybody sees essentially new taxes as just other ways in which the government can separate you from your money. And we've never done an experiment where it says, yes, 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 okay, we're going to start charging for the roads, but as a result, fuel costs might go down a little bit and income tax might fall by 1%. We've never had an intelligent experiment where we're charging for the roads, but the money's hypothecated to the NHS because yeah. the Treasury hates the idea of hypothecation. Yes. So we have a lot of obstacles, I think, to the psychological popularity of these things. There's one idea I had, by the way, I'll just add, which is I, I was in Seven Oak Station car park and I pretty much blagged the last space at nine o'clock and was heading to the station. And there was a desperate guy there who clearly had an interview at Goldman Sachs and couldn't find anywhere to park. <laughs> and I wasn't quite charitable enough to give him my space. I, mean, I had arrived four minutes earlier and I'd already paid. Okay. But it did occur to me that if you had 10 charitable spaces at a station car park where you could park there for the ordinary price, plus a £10 donation to the World Wildlife Fund or, you know, whatever it may be. Yeah. Okay. It's a way of separating willingness to pay without necessarily being seen to be profiteering. And just as you have disabled spaces, it seems reasonable to reserve a number of spaces for the desperate. Because you know, I, I've never applied for a job at Goldman Sachs, but I've always had lunch that they probably don't respond all that well if you turn up 20 minutes late. <laughs> you know. And I did feel for this guy. Mm -hmm. And so reserving a certain number of charitable parking spaces on each street so that people who are desperate to park know they'll always be able to park, it just requires them to make a donation to some worthy cause, would be a really interesting experiment. Yeah, I agree. Can I just say that um, yeah. when we introduced the London congestion charge, uh, I was vice chair of Transport for London. and. Uh, we did hypothecate uh, the surplus. As socialists, we didn't make a profit, but we did make a surplus. <clears throat> and uh, we put it to improving bus services to encourage people to leave their cars at home. Uh, and we started new bus services. We doubled the night bus service. Uh, we put it into uh, pedestrian facilities, uh, walking maps around London. Uh, we put it into uh, new crossings and to uh, give more traffic light control for pedestrians. And we also put it into cycling, more cycle paths and things like that. So we were taking the money from motorists, but we were putting it back into the system itself to encourage fewer people to drive and more people to use a uh, sustainable form of transport okay so i'll come to you in a second about that the the idea of hypothecation is a word that in your as a transport journalist it's kind of i've been using it for 20 years but there was an a sort of an amusing take on the idea of hypothecation and so if you're not listening to this in the uk or outside the uk the city of durham in the northeast of england is a historic city and about just after the london congestion charge came in in 2003 2004 i think it was durham had their own um congestion charge and the idea was all the money from the congestion charge will be put into Durham City Council's coffers to keep um, the charge going and therefore pay for the upkeep of the city. The ancient, the ancient parts of Durham were being ruined by, by petrol and all kind of particulate matter and that kind of stuff. But so few people used the scheme that there wasn't enough money to keep the scheme going, they had to cancel it. Anyway, that's, how, that's when hypothecation doesn't work. How, how expensive was it? I think it was about eight quid. It's more expensive. I think it was more expensive than the London congestion charge at the time, which in 2003 was five pounds, Dave. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Five. Yeah. So it was bizarre. Anyway, did, not enough people used it to keep it going. So that's why, where hypothecation doesn't kind of kills itself. But um, Eric. An interesting yeah. aside on that. <laughs> yeah. In all our planning, we were going to charge seven pounds. Yeah. And um, the figure leaked to the media. 
Yes, I, I have the, to say, I, have, I, I was help challenged that. about the charge, <laughs> what it was going to be. Be, yeah. you know, and this was about a year before we introduced it. So when I discussed it with uh, Ken, I said, "Well, they know we're going to charge seven pound." He, he said, "Oh, well, sorry, we'll charge five pound just to prove them wrong." <laughs> <laughs> I, I was I was one of those journalists that did break the story that it was seven quid. So I apologise, Dave. If I messed up your day seventeen years ago. Apologise. So, Eric, can you tell me who leaked it to you? <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> you, you must no, protect I, your I, sources. I, I've completely forgotten, <laughs> Eric. Time for you to say something. So, what what okay. Rory was saying, therefore, just now about the whole idea of you know, sharing and of, of paying for road space. It was that yep. was what Rory, Rory was saying. That was that music to your ears after seventeen years of of saying pretty much exactly the same thing. Absolutely. The simple fact of the matter is that when I came up with it, I was using experience from energy markets. I used to work as research science international grid. I got a year out just before I started Imperial Aeronautics. And what we were doing was we were building systems to predict what the weather would be, because it turns out that you could put more power down existing infrastructure if you know it's going to be cold and windy and wet, which is most of the time in the UK, most of the time. And the simple fact of the matter is the limiting factor on how much power you can transmit on power lines is based on the total current. Now, when it's windy, it cools down the line. So you can actually, in fact, quadruple, in the best case, the amount of power. This prevents you having to build more infrastructure, more power lines. We haven't got a lack of, trans we haven't got a lack of generation capacity. We've got a lack of transmission capacity, much like the roads. So I thought, why can't we apply the same idea to the roads where you can even pay people who have a right to use a certain amount of power that they've paid for? You can pay them for not using the power. So you're not actually creating any new taxes. You're just redistributing the same collection of money in order to better use the infrastructure we have got. And the whole point is this is politically feasible because just like if you're standing in a queue and somebody rushes up and says to everybody in the queue one at a time, I'm really sorry, I'm really late. If I give you a pound or two pounds, or you allow me to jump ahead of you in the queue? I'm in the United States, I believe this is called, you can pay queue standards, you can pay people to go and stand in line for you. And then when you're ready, you come and take their place. That doesn't affect anybody adversely because that person was already in place. Yep. Some people get very upset with that, thinking, well, you just find the rich to jump ahead. But if there is a commons which is better managed by such a system where people who need something can get it at some price rather than not getting it at all, that surely is a better outcome. And that's not just neoliberal or Hayek or von Mies type thinking. We can actually see that in process. It's a scarce resource which isn't managed as such when we look at airlines and airspace, that's exactly what they do. They auction space. Most of what an airline pays is for access to the airport, landing slots. You can actually have a company which doesn't operate aircraft, but instead sells the slots it's bought to other airlines. You can actually quite make a profit, probably not now with all the restrictions on um, aircraft and whatever yeah. else. <clears throat> but once we apply these principles, which have been proved in other areas like electricity and gas as well and airspace and electromagnetic spectrum we can change everything for example if you've ever lived near a rat run a road where people just come down to avoid traffic lights or whatever that's maddening the <clears throat> council can't block off the road because it might be a strategic route and you need to send um, yeah. ambulances or fire engines but what you can do very cheaply as dave and ken livingston showed with London is you can charge people for accessing that route at certain times. Even better, you can pay people who live near that route for the inconvenience of anybody coming down there. So it's not the council taking the payment, it's the people who live there who are being inconvenienced by the traffic, who are getting the majority of the benefit from the collections. So there are many ways to do this. And in fact, from what Rory said about options, that's exactly what we said. For my sins, I did a five or six years in investment banking and then in hedge funds. And so I learned all about options and all these ideas. And what we can also do with options is literally say to people, you've got an option that you can sell. You can either exercise that option and buy something at a specific price, or you can monetize that option if you know you're not going to need it and you can sell that. That also becomes a form of income 
for people who are less mobile, that'd be the older people. And that would actually benefit everyone. And if you imagine a city like Jakarta in Indonesia or Manila in the Philippines, they've got immense traffic problems. Yeah. And um, there are people who actually make a living offering to get into your car with you so you can get to the high occupancy vehicle lane. This is unbelievable, but this is the marketing yeah. action. So there's like street kids who will say, we'll get in your car. So you will now technically have three people in your car so you can uh -huh. use the high occupancy vehicle lane. And you give them a few a buck or two, and it works for everyone. Well, if we could formalize that into this whole idea, as what we said, that you can actually pay to use these based on what your need is, you will find that the, the level will even out. You'll find that people will start to work out when they need to go in in order to maximize their part of the commons that they get by default. So effectively, we're not allowing any one group to monopolize the road. It won't be for the rich, it won't be for the poor, it be for everyone and be based on needs that you have. And when you think about it, actually, the, the, I mean, in any case, if you take that business of paying people to queue, you could argue, OK, that if it's a rock concert and you have to queue for an hour to buy tickets, it is at least a measure of how committed you are as a fan of the band. OK, mm -hmm. if you take it with access to road use, it's actually even worse because a nobody gains through any kind of financial exchange. It's purely wasted time. But worse still, the roads become the problem is the least for people whose journey is least urgent. So you have this problem where, in theory, people who are going to see their mothers-in-law, a terrible old hackney joke, but people who weren't particularly eager to, to arrive at their destination are much less bothered by a traffic jam than someone who's got a business interview, a job interview. Yeah, okay. And so the roads end up actually being used by the people who, le who need them least. So at least the rock concert thing is kind of proof of willingness to pay. Whereas actually, the very people who could shift their time most easily are the people who are least bothered by a traffic jam. Yeah. And so it's kind of like a double whammy. And I think, um, you know, you know it, it becomes actually, of course, more um, acute if we invent both electric and driverless cars and they gain greater and greater adoption because the cost of sitting still in an in a electric car is zero. Um, and arguably, you know, people with time to kill aren't particularly bothered about sitting in a driverless car doing the crossword or playing bridge or whatever. OK, yes. <clears throat> so, so so I mean, this is a problem which even if we don't sort it now, it's going to rear its head much more severely in another 10 years. Sure. In fact, that's yeah. a, a, sorry to interrupt, that's a Hello. thing called a boomerang. Errol Avenari told me about this. He's a researcher in the Apik Institute in Israel. And it's something that says that when you increase the fuel efficiency of cars and you make driving cheaper or almost free, you'll actually increase traffic congestion and you actually go backwards. So that's an actual noted effect which has been seen called boomerang. It's, it's similar to the Givon's paradox, which was that when, when steam engines became more efficient, coal consumption went up. Yes. Because people discovered more and more uses for efficient steam engines. Yeah, so exactly overall it. demand for coal increased. Actually, but you do that when you when you widen the motorway and you add a lane, the traffic increases. People think, oh, good, it's an extra lane. I can I can now drive on that lane, and everybody does it. That's that. You, the more you increase capacity, the more you increase demand. I did like what Eric said about um, an airline company that doesn't necessarily have any aircraft, because the UK government, for those of you who don't know, recently gave a contract to operate a ferry line to a company that had no ferries. Anyway, we won't, we won't, go, we won't go down there. Rory is nodding sheepishly, but anyway. Um, so I'm going to drop it. I'm going to slightly move the conversation on. Could be, this, we could talk about this bit all, all day long, but we, we have got a limited amount of time. Um, actually, actually, it's worth saying that the amount of intervention you need doesn't have to be massive. In the sense that a car park that's full is completely useless. A car park that yeah. has three spare spaces is a great car park. And in the same way, a road that is just, you know, at which you can travel at 50 miles an hour or so without ever grinding to a halt yeah. is a pretty good road. And the difference between that and a disastrously overcrowded road is probably only 10 to 20 percent of, of uh, road users. It's, yeah. You only need to operate at the margins. Yeah. Well, that's where Dur that's well, where Durham got that's where Durham got it wrong. You could have yes. achieved the same disincentive effect with a quid to, 
if my experience of, of the people of Monmouth and their willingness to pay for parking is anything to go by, a pound is a fair old distance. Yeah, no, that's true. We'll, we'll come back to that because we're going we're to finish on that topic. But I'm going to drop a phrase in. I want to see what everyone's reaction is. Uh, those of you listening, of course, you can't see the reaction, but you'll hear it. Um, so I'm going to use the phrase reverse leapfrogging. Who wants to make a comment about reverse leapfrogging? Eric has just put his hand up. I wish you could see yeah. this. Eric has very keenly raised a hand, a literal, actual hand, not a virtual hand. Eric, reverse leapfrogging, explain. This is an idea which I first saw written about by World Changing, which was a green blog in 2005, where they said some of the <laughs> best ideas, actually old ideas, everything old is new again. So the Dolmush in um, Turkey, the... Um, various car and ride sharing things that you get the collectivo in south american countries all of this was actually a great idea a long time ago and in <clears> fact <throat> before the introduction of trams and streetcars in the united states cities you actually had jitneys you actually had people sharing taxis all the time until uh, anti-market forces basically intervened to basically enable a monopoly for the streetcar companies and to get rid of shared taxis. In Belfast, I believe there are still shared taxis, but you can learn lots of ideas from supposedly primitive cultures and you can leapfrog ahead by adopting things which were supposedly old hat or primitive because with a little application of some newish technologies that we've just got, those old ideas become very useful and for example, ride sharing and accessing the road and paying a small amount, a micro amount to actually share a vehicle to go where you're going, that all works in the same way. So that's my um, belief about reverse leapfrogging. There's so many things we can learn. Dave, uh, Eric there mentioned green thinking. You're a, you are politically a green. Where do you stand on this idea? Yeah, I think uh, we can learn a lot from uh, other people, other countries, uh, and from history and things that they've done uh, in the past. And I think the trouble with the British establishment is, um, dare I say, the university system has tended to produce people that think on tram lines. Uh, the biggest example I can give uh, on this type of thinking is um, in China, uh, I met uh, people who were running international consultancies uh, and they were recruiting Chinese graduates. And uh, in China, whenever I spoke to university students, I always went round the lecture hall and shook hands with every student there before and gives them a business card before I started my lecture. And I tried to treat the students as equals. But in China, students are very much in awe of their uh, lecturers and their professors. Uh, and they just churn out in rote exactly what they're told. Uh, and they, I speak generally, I can't speak of every uh, graduate there, but uh, they, their thinking is on tram lines. <coughs> and right. when this consultancy recruited people, <coughs> the first thing they did with Chinese recruits that they wanted to work in China, they would send them to the United States, Australia, or to Britain to learn to think out the box. Uh, and I think even though they sent them to Britain to learn to think out the box, I think our civil service and our top management, uh, yeah, why don't we make motorbikes in this country? Why don't we uh, have our own car companies making cars? I think it's because senior management did not think out the box. And uh, I, I like the idea uh, of looking to see what other people are doing, what they've done in the past, and learning from their experience. Uh, and Eric, to me, is a prime example of the person who does exactly that. Very commendable, Eric. Well, well, well Eric's, Eric's brilliant example is that he drew inspiration from the power grid and what you might call the yield management of the power grid and made the translation laterally to roads. And we have a thing we call lateral category analysis, um, 
uh, which is your problem has probably been solved by somebody else in a different field and nobody's thought laterally enough to make the connection. There's a, there's a similar Soviet era innovation thing called Triz. Have you ever come across this? No. Um, no, no. The poor guy, he, he, was, he was set, I think in Stalin's Russia, he was set to look at Western innovation and what made it successful. And he wrote down a series of uh, rules and findings about where the West was good at innovating, which unfortunately ended him a long stay in the gulag because some of his recommendations were politically a bit awkward. Um, but it's, a, it's, it's T-R-I-Z, I think it is, and it's a very interesting thing, but they're absolutely <clears throat> um, clear on this idea that someone's already solved your problem somewhere. It's just that either distances of geography or time or business sector prevent people from making the connection. Okay. Interesting stuff. Thank you for that. Right then, so we get, we're going to get on to the last subject, which Rory did bring up a minute ago. So the idea of of implementing a road space time scheme where we're auctioning road road space to users whether they you know, whether it's deserved users or non-deserved users or whichever way you want to look at it that needs to be implemented at a politically and environmentally and financially perfect time that perfect storm of right now's the time to do it so is now the time to do it because you you mentioned earlier on in episode one as well Roy that you have occasion to drive again if you're not listening if you're outside the uk you live in the east of the uk in kent and you have reason to drive to the west in in, in to wales and during this last few months you found that journey much easier much more pleasurable you'd be able to drive from your home to your destination in wales without having to stop um and normally you stop for traffic we said that that western part of the m25 really is a absolute lottery um it's around, around around Heathrow, and if you, you can if you can drive through there and get to the M4 without having to stop at least twenty times, you've done you've done well. So, is now the right time to bring in some a scheme such as this that's slightly not controversial, but it's it's a new way of thinking. It's gonna it's you know it's breaking the mold if you like. Is now the time to do it? Yes, it's certainly a time to experiment. We don't know yet how to do this perfectly. I and mean, the London congestion charge isn't a bad uh, first attempt, and we should learn from that. Um, but one of, the, one of the reasons I'd argue is that I think what COVID has given people is a kind of selfish case for environmentalism. And if I have a slight criticism of the environmental movement, it tends to emphasize the hair-shirted aspects of what it does. Whereas there are perfectly selfish reasons to want to live in a cleaner environment. You know, it's quieter, it's safer, the air's cleaner, we like the presence of wildlife. <laughs> <Yeah>. Okay. <clears throat> um, there are a few things I'd like to look at, which I don't think have been adequately investigated, which is the assumption is that you pay to use a stretch of road, regardless of how often you use that stretch of road. And that yeah. seems to me to be an unequal incentive. Now, mm -hmm. One, way, one thing I'd, I'd experiment with would be the opposite of Amazon Prime. Why does Amazon Prime work? You want people to buy frequently from Amazon. Uh, you get them to pay up front. And then every subsequent delivery becomes cheaper. Therefore, if you want to disincentivize travel, arguably you should do Amazon Prime in a reverse, which is, uh, you know, you earn £100 through not traveling. You lose that money. The, I, the, first of all, a certain proportion of everybody's journeys should be free. OK, that, that's one. You know, I don't want to live in a kind of country with zill lanes. Everybody has the right once a year to drive up the mall if they want to for free in my in my book. OK. Yeah. Um, and the pricing should become disproportionately, you might argue, in some cases, more expensive the more people make the journey. If you want a strong disincentive, if you want a weak disincentive, it should be the opposite. Now, if you ever travel to France, where, of course, you pay for motorways because they're privatized. The strange thing you notice when you get out of the Euro tunnel is that for the first 80 miles of auto route, nearly all the cars on the auto route are English. <laughs> God, yeah. they basically built a motorway just for us. How hospitable is this? And then you realize, of course, to a Brit, you make that journey twice a year. So paying 25 quid each way is kind of irrelevant when framed against the cost of your holiday. If you live locally, you're going to find a way to avoid that because paying 20 pounds 50 times a year is serious money okay and so we've never quite worked out in pricing the fact that one times ten isn't the same as ten times one that making ten people pay five five pounds once is much much easier well the season ticket i suppose is an example of where we acknowledge that yeah 
And we need to understand that depending on the level of disincentive we want, in London, you might want a strong disincentive. Your first 10 journeys are free. If you don't make your next 10 journeys, you actually get some money back at the end of the year, conceivably. And then after that, it becomes exponentially. Oh, Rory, we've lost Rory. And if you can hear us, Rory, we've lost you. Hang on a second, let's stop recording. Rory. Now, so. I mentioned on the auto route that when you drive out of uh, the shuttle terminal in Calais and you drive down, I think it's the A10, and for the first 70 miles, nearly all the cars on the auto route are English. You think, bloody hell, they build a motorway just for us. How, how welcoming Ooh. is that? And then you realize, of course, to a British tourist who makes that trip once a year in each direction, or maybe at the most twice, you know, 10, 15 pounds for the use of that motorway is a relatively trivial amount of money. Yeah. Okay. To a local, multiply that by 50 times a year, even 25 times a year, it starts to get seriously expensive. And in some cases, I think the French auto routes have priced wrongly in that locals should pay less. Okay, now it all depends whether you want a strong disincentive to travel, in which case what I do is Amazon Prime in reverse. Amazon Prime is a loyalty mechanism where you pay money up front and then all your subsequent purchases become progressively cheaper because you're never paying for delivery. Okay, so it encourages frequent use of the service through a commitment device and then repeated benefits. Arguably, if you want to really discourage people driving in London, you do it backwards. So you, maybe your first 10 journeys should be free. I don't, you know, I don't want to live in a kind of country with the zill lanes. I think everybody's got the right to drive up the mall once or twice a year for free. After that, maybe you start losing a refund, first of all, so your rebate gets cancelled, and then you start paying exponentially. And as a result, that would be a very strong disincentive. And in certain cases, that's a great way to do it. In other cases, the disincentive is so strong for frequent users that it effectively reserves auto routes for tourist traffic. And in that case, locals or frequent users should be given a discount because in the same way that a season ticket works, okay? Commuting is not commutative. And one person paying 10 pounds 10 times is not the same disincentive Economics doesn't really understand the distinction because it thinks of a journey as having utility. But I don't think our behaviour actually operates on that basis. Sure. Dave, what, what do you think? Is it is now the right time? Is, is, I, did this, I don't like the phrase perfect storm. It's a bit sort of dramatic, but maybe it is. Maybe this is the right time to, to do things. I mentioned in the last episode that there are cities around the world, especially in Europe, that are implementing schemes within weeks of them being dreamt up in the past it would take years now it's, it's let's just do it let's let's make people's lives easier while we can i don't see too much evidence uh, of that and uh, traffic congestion is still uh, a big problem uh, worldwide and i welcome what you said about building new roads just generates uh, more traffic you put it in the context uh, of an additional lane on a motorway yeah. But it's true of the uh, building new roads, particularly in the urban environment, they just generate uh, more traffic. Now, I'm not listening um, to Rory. I'm not sure everyone would know necessarily what a Zill lane is. Uh, but I went to St. Petersburg and to Moscow um, several times during the Soviet Union times. And uh, it was apparent you could see these... Uh, lanes dedicated for uh, officials of the communist party and the government and these people would be driven in zil uh, limousines yes. and they were on lanes only for the zil limous limousine so uh, interrupt him after it and oh. something Sorry. none of us uh, <clears throat> want to see whether we're on the right of British politics or like me, or on the left of British politics. I, I do like the idea of uh, being able to share uh, and everybody having uh, something, little amount for free uh, and then paying because of uh, the need of uh, scarcity. Uh, and in traffic terms, I, I think that works well. We at the GLC 
back in 1981 uh, considered whether we should put to the electorate a uh, road pricing system or uh, which we called the whip or the carrot which we considered to be improvements to public transport and, and cheaper fares uh, and we chose the carrot not the whip but people's thinking have moved on from 1981. Incidentally I, I found uh, one of my officers brought me to my attention a consultant's report which had been done secretly for the previous Conservative administration on uh, road pricing with little coloured discs in the windows of cars like what was the tax disc you'd have a coloured disc to allow you to drive in London. Um, of course when 2000 came along we could have a computerized system uh, which was much uh, better but even so looking at the congestion charge system today it's pretty basic um, we knew that at the time but uh, it was risky nobody else had done anything like it uh, before and uh, nobody was sure uh, like you mentioned as regards uh, the durham experiment whether a contractor would make a profit out of it or, or a loss yeah. uh, and so the first bids were extremely high very expensive and uh, we had to bite the bullet we didn't take the most expensive one which would have probably been the best in terms of technology etc but we chose the second best which was considerably cheaper it did give us headaches they in terms of performance but we resolve that <clears throat> but today you'd have a much more sophisticated system the roads which are more heavily used in time of day which are more heavily used the pricing would go up for those periods and on those roads and uh, other roads it would be much less a marginal road yeah. would actually be free uh, and I, I call congestion charging land value tax on wheels because we live on a planet where where we want to live and where we want to extract minerals and uh, produce goods land is scarce and the best way i believe to manage that scarcity isn't for private individual landowners to charge uh, and pocket the uh, value of the scarcity i think that that scarcity value the value of sites should go into the common purse and then we could do away with things like VAT and income tax uh, and poor old uh, Donald Trump would not be castigated because he only paid X amount in income tax because if he was taxed on the site of his buildings the Trump Towers around America he couldn't avoid paying that the site is there, Google Maps would show us the site and he would pay his tax which would be his share of the rent of that site and nobody would be looking at his expenses if he spent $70,000 on a haircut each year then that's his business, nothing to do with the tax man. Yeah sure and for those again outside the UK we've explained what a Zill Lane is, GLC was the Greater London Council which we should explain to those people, maybe not in, in, in London and if you're under the age of 40, you may not know. So look, so the Tories, before you guys got in, was that Horace Cutler? Yes. It was, wow. I'm showing my age there, aren't I? Okay, Eric, let's finish with you then. So how does this, this perfect storm play out then? To, so what, we, what I want to do with these podcasts is to have, it's great talking well, about stuff, it's fascinating, it's... but how do, we, how do we implement it? How do we, how do we, how do we sort of um, persuade the powers that be to do the right thing and maybe implement some of the things we're talking about. Derek? He can't hear you at all. So this is, this is, a, this is the- Shall I step in? Step in, please do step in, Dave. Because this, this is the wonders of Zoom where every now and again people drop out. Anyway, carry on. Thank you. The, it seems to me that no time is the right time. Sometimes for revolutionary change, for real change that's going to make a difference. The uh, people that will benefit from any change uh, will not shout about the benefits. 
and yet the people that are going to be disbenefited and it's my experience whatever radical change you make there will always be some people disbenefited they're going to be the ones that shout the loudest and uh, so therefore politicians and civil servants and local government officers get frightened off uh, and they don't want to make a change because they don't want to stir up trouble and yet you have to be prepared to stir up trouble if you're going to do changes that are beneficial to people and i found that introducing the travel card back in 1983 i found it introducing the uh, london wide lorry ban in 1986 and i found it introducing congestion charge in 2003 but if you're going to make those sort of changes first of all you do i agree with lorry rory you do need to uh, <clears throat> have the research on your side and in each of those cases we have plenty of research on our side you need to create a public debate it's no good having secret uh, consultancy reports what you've got to do is publicize all that stuff and get people talking about it uh, i was going to say in the pubs but only before 10 o'clock yes and uh, get people talking about <laughs> it in, in their families uh, and what have you yeah we I also, remember we also need to have politicians with some sort of backbone people that are prepared to lead and not follow if you just follow the crowd you're not going to make positive changes you have to lead people by educating people using the mass media and i would say these days uh using uh, social media as well mm -hmm. in order to get people thinking about it and small experiments yes by all means because then from a small experiment people can see that it can work but um, and things like the abolition of slavery wasn't <coughs> done in one foul swoop first of all wilberforce and others got the slave trade shipping people from africa to the west indies and america abolished they made it illegal the slave trade but it was still legal to own slaves for another 50 years so perhaps we need to do things gradually but always stepping in the correct direction not in the opposite so congestion charge was a small experiment and it worked and others have followed in other parts of the world not many but some sure and uh, we now in this country need to extend that i believe first of all to all our motorways uh, and then <clears throat> in london we should extend the congestion charge make it london wide but where there's a marginal road with no traffic congestion make it zero cost and uh, where there's a lot of congestion either at the time of day or on the particular road <coughs> then you increase the charge but make it variable don't have it as a static charge like the congestion charge have a variable charge uh, and you can play tunes on the organ and you can encourage your traffic to move sensibly but at the same time as all that we didn't do congestion charge in a box of its own at the same time we were improving public transport and we were making public transport cheaper yep. and i think those two things need to go together well again we talked we've talked about things coming from the past obviously um rory mentioned john locke's um ideas from the, from the 1600s so a little bit more recent than that but the first variable road pricing scheme was brought in in singapore in 1975 and here we are 45 years later still discussing the idea that, that this could be a good idea. It, it worked. It still works for them. Eric's, Eric's broadband has repaired itself. Eric, do you want to finish this off? Because we're talking about kind of your idea of, of road space time and slots and dividing up yeah. road space time into allocated um, segments. How do we get this idea implemented? How do we get the right people in the right places to even hear this? I think we have with here what Dave has said um, by putting in the congestion charge in 2003 that coming from a very fiercely left-wing Labour administration that was incredible that was very very hard to do and amazing it got done yeah. and it was a great success you can compare Paris as a control to London as an active measure and 
Paris is a bit of a roulette wheel. It, take, it can take you 10 minutes to go one route within the city one day. It can take Tell you me an about hour. it, yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Just like on the motorway, <clears throat> the Je Jevons paradox, exactly correct. That whole boomerang idea that you can do one thing to reduce stuff and make it worse. In Copenhagen, funnily enough, when the masks were being, there was a run on masks and toilet paper, what one shop in Copenhagen did was say, you'll get the first roll of toilet paper, the first mask you buy at the normal price, but the next one is at a variable price, which you will increase. So you made sure everybody could always get one of everything, and then the price went into increase. That's the same as the idea I've said about if everybody's a commons got a certain amount of road use, based yeah. on mean road use, they could then choose to sell some of their road use for extra income or stagger their times. And that's a way we can make this socially equitable. What we're effectively doing is we're doing a type of market-led redistribution without um, inconveniencing anybody too much. We can do small experiments, for example, in places with rat runs where people are going down residential streets to avoid traffic lights implement a time-based congestion charge and you can then say specifically with hypothecation that that money must be spent on any improving for example parking crossings or enforcement or the pavements in that specific area it cannot be used as general fund what you'll find very quickly is people will stop using those as rat runs and that's an easy small experiment to do which has political ramifications to say to people we're making your life better we're not yeah. trying to increase taxes that's the simple fact, selling, yeah. it, selling it to the public, selling the idea to the public that what they're getting is something that benefits them. That's, and that's, they can see that immediately. Yeah. Visible benefit. So, so I think the most ironic thing about both congestion charging, um, road pricing, and some of these ideas is that they have an intersection between the supposed super left and super right wing parts of the political mm -hmm. spectrum. It, it's, it's almost like it's a tourist meeting at the other end because I've seen this um, borne out with lots of different places. And this can work. We've seen it work with electricity markets, electromagnetic spectrum and airlines. We just need to apply it to roads. Singapore showed the way. But when you start saying to people, you're going to actually be paid for not using the road, you're going to get money every single day for not using the road, that undoes a political roadblock. So that's my um, okay. congestion charge. Uh, Eric makes a very interesting point about where this sits on the political spectrum. And I think there may be a kind of paradox, which is where people, I always remember Ken Livingston when he was leader of the GLC defending road pricing. And the journalist was kind of attacking him as if it was kind of left wing anti car measure. And Ken replied, I don't know why you're getting so angry about this. It's pure Adam Smith, which of course it is. And indeed, Adam Smith supported land value tax. Let's not forget this, as did Milton Friedman, as did Winston Churchill, interestingly. Okay. And I sometimes wonder that if politics becomes a point scoring exercise, really good ideas which have appeal on both wings won't get adopted. If you see politics as a way of humiliating your opposition, ideas which actually appeal to people both on the right and the left strangely lose power because your motivation is annoying the opposition group. And this is interesting because undoubtedly, I mean, we're, we're from a fairly wide political spectrum here, I suspect. Yeah. And yet we're all in favour of this. <clears throat> and yet, logically, those would be the ideas which we adopted really, really quickly. It's not helped, by the way, by a journalistic cast who, if ever you propose anything, will go out of their way to find the seven people who are adversely affected and make a story out of it. Yes. I mean, there's something about our journalism which is fundamentally detrimental to innovation as well. Yeah, no, I agree. As a, as a journalist, I, I don't take that personally, but yes, I, I know, I know <laughs> exactly what you mean. So we've come to the end of our time. So thank you all once again. Thank you to Eric and to Rory and to Dave. Also, we must also thank uh, Jason Jones, who is editing our podcast bits together. Thank you, Jason. Yes, thank, thank you. Well, thank you. well done, Jason. Um, um, so thanks for, for doing that. So again, thank you for listening. You, just, you had the first two episodes now of The New. Um, we are, we'll be back very shortly with, with more episodes, perhaps different guests, we're not sure yet, but we'll have different guests on and we'll be talking about slightly different subjects. But what we're looking at is new ways of doing things and has, has COVID-19, has this bizarre situation we find ourselves in with a global pandemic, which seems to be getting worse again. Um, is it opening up new avenues of business opportunities, new economic modelling, and giving ourselves a whole new perspective on, on old 
on old ideas. I think, was it, was it Chris Rea had an album out called New Light Through Old Windows? I quite like that. Not a Chris Rea fan, but I think that was what the album was called. Anyway. Berlin. Yes. As a Marxist, can I just make a comment? Oh, yes, please do. The thing yes. about Adam Smith. Yes. Because um, I yes. had to give a lecture on the history of road pricing. And I thought it went back to the 1920s, where some professor was writing about it. But I actually discovered, and I'm endorsing what Rory said about Adam Smith, that Adam Smith had written about road pricing um, in terms of tolls, having toll roads. Uh, and what he actually said, and it amazed me, because I, I was brainwashed by the right to think Adam Smith was a terrible bloke. But having read him, I think he's quite a wise person. I completely agree. He's a philosopher, yeah. not an economist. Yeah. And what he, he said about road pricing is when you have a wagon carrying essential goods to the village, then that wagon should be charged very, very lightly. But when you have a rich person in their post chase, then they should be charged heavily. And uh, I didn't know that Adam Smith ever talked socialism, but to me, that sounds like pure socialism. So that's it. the next episode will be the new socialism with Dave Wendell. <laughs> 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 anyway, so gentlemen, thank you for your time. And thank you all for listening. Um, we'll be back soon with episode three of the new. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.